There are so many myths and misconceptions when it comes to the world of software development. What do you guys do all day? How much leak code do you really need to know? In my last video, I talked about some of the biggest lies in software engineering, and that garnered a lot of interest. So I thought I'd do another follow-up video going over some of the things I didn't get a chance to cover. These are a little bit controversial, and it goes without saying that they're totally based on my own opinion. So if you completely disagree with me, that's totally fine. Let me know in the comments below. The first major misconception is that all tech companies know exactly what they're doing and have their together. I don't know why I had this perception in my head that most SaaS companies were these innovative, well-oiled machines writing the cleanest code possible and had 100% test coverage and they all knew what they were doing. At one SaaS company in particular that I worked at many years ago that I'm not going to name for obvious reasons, I was kind of shocked by how the best practices I learned in school really flew out the window. We had literally zero tests, no QA team. So half the time, the testing strategy was just deploying to production, hoping for the best and reverting it if something happened. Granted, it was a very lean startup and it was ran by a bunch of guys in their early 30s. And our main focus was putting out fires and survival. So writing tests wasn't really a priority. I was young and naive and I thought that they had their together because they had a really nice office and their marketing was sleek and supposedly they had a ton of customers. But in reality, this shiny, cool and impressive software product that I saw from the outside was behind the scenes wire and duct tape on the inside. In fact, I remember one incident where there was a really big fire, a really big production bug, and the lead engineer, just out of sheer desperation, had to fix it immediately. So instead of creating a hot fix and then going through the deployment process, he directly SSH'd into the production server and just started testing directly on production and refreshing the page. Yeah, I wish I was joking. And while this case is extreme, it serves as a reminder to not be intimidated by polished exteriors or big names. Tech companies that we tend to put on a pedestal probably have problems and flaws and broken processes behind the scenes that we don't necessarily see. Number two. Anyone and everyone with an internet connection can be a self-taught software engineer. A few years ago before the pandemic, there was this big push to get everybody who worked in a dying industry like journalism or truck driving to learn to code. Anybody who can throw coal into a furnace can learn how to program for God's sake. I'm not trying to gatekeep coding because I truly do believe that everyone can learn to code given enough grit and time and willpower, but I think we need to be realistic about how difficult that can be to do on your own if you're not surrounded physically by other very motivated people to keep you accountable and you're not following a structured program with this um, threat of very tight deadlines. The reality is online courses such as massive open open online courses and tutorials have an abysmal completion rate, somewhere between 5 and 15%. Compare this with 62% for in-person university programs. I mean, how many times have we started a tutorial motivated and excited to finish it only to give up halfway through? Social media has perpetuated this false notion that anyone and everyone with an internet connection can just easily spend six months going through online courses Courses and they come out of that making six figures. This naive perspective flies in the face of reality, which is the fact that you'll be spending months, if not possibly years, struggling with something you're not good at and dealing with the uncertainty of whether or not you're even going the right direction. For example, you might be tempted to skip understanding JavaScript at a deep foundational level and, and instead jumping straight into learning React, uh, which I see all the time. By the way, that's a bad idea. At the end of the day, I think we just need to be realistic about the amount of support that we actually do need. And there's no shame in doing that. That could save you a lot of time. You got to ask yourself, 
Do you have the focus and discipline necessary to study for hours upon hours every day without someone else keeping you accountable? Do you have the time and resources to dedicate months to full-time studying? I'm going to make a comparison here to fitness goals. When I was first trying to get into shape 10 years ago, I knew that there were tons of free programs online, there were subreddits and YouTube videos, and technically I could do it all for free. But at the end of the day, I still paid for a personal trainer because I knew that at the time, I didn't build up the skills and discipline necessary to help me get over those initial hurdles. And there was a chance that I could hit a roadblock that was really big and I just get demotivated and quit. So I think we just all need to be a little bit more realistic, check our ego at the door and spend some money and hire someone else to help us out. Whether that means, you know, going to a boot camp or a better idea might be to go back to school and get a computer science degree. The next misconception I want to go over is the idea that if you're a software engineer, your entire job consists of coding. There is so much more to being a software developer than simply coding. And this is especially the case the further up the ladder you go. Depending on your company, you're probably spending somewhere around 50 to 70% of your time coding as a junior and intermediate, probably around 50% as a senior, and maybe even less once you become a tech lead. The rest of the time, yes, you're in meetings, but you're also doing other stuff. You're doing code reviews, asking stakeholders for feedback. You're writing design documents, uh, keeping up with all the nonsense going on in Slack, going to mandatory free beer Fridays with your coworkers. Also, even when you are coding, unless you have the immense privilege of starting a project from scratch, most of your coding time is really diving into the code base, trying to understand what other engineers before you have done so that you can follow your company's best practices and patterns. So really, even your coding time is mostly spent reading code rather than writing code. In school, there is so much emphasis on the coding side of things, but what I didn't realize was that there were so many other skills that you really have to master in order to be a good engineer. And honestly, this is why I kind of wish I worked on open source projects a bit more when I was learning, because I feel like that's really more reflective of what you're really going to be doing at a job. You're learning how to quickly understand an existing code base, collaborate with other people, learn how to make realistic trade-offs, work with libraries. And these are things that I feel like aren't really emphasized in school. Myth number four. You must grind leak code for months and be really good at it in order to even try to find a job. I hear new grads complain about this all the time. I hate how we need to grind leak code for months before finding a job. No other job requires this. It's so unfair. I'm not sure if this is common knowledge now, but unless you want to work for more in the big tech companies like Facebook, Meta or Google, you don't actually need to grind leak code. In the eight or so years I've worked as a software developer, I've only been asked two or three leak code questions and they've been fairly easy ones. Maybe I'm a little bit biased because I've interviewed primarily at non-fang companies, but if you just want a job and you don't care about working for Google, you don't really need to spend up to a year grinding leak code questions. Now, if you do wanna know what kind of questions I've been asked during interviews for these front end positions, I'm going to link a video to the JavaScript interview questions video I did a, a while ago, so go check that one out. That being said, if you are looking to shoot for the moon and find a job at a big tech company like Facebook, Meta, or Amazon, then yes, you will need to suffer for a few months. But if you think about it, that's one of the reasons why their salaries are so inflated, right? If you're losing motivation while grinding leak code, just remind yourself that if you already have a degree, a few more months of grinding leak code could net you an extra 50 to $100,000. So it's a pretty high return on your time investment. The reality is most people won't be able to go through with this and that's what makes it valuable. High barrier to entry means less people are willing to go through with it and that means a higher payoff for people willing to endure the pain. If you feel this is unfair and you have to put in all of this unpaid effort, just remind yourself there are liberal arts students out there graduating after four years of college with six figures in debt and working at Starbucks. 
Do I think Leak Code is a good interview format and a good way to screen candidates? Not necessarily, which brings me to my next point. And misconception number five, if you didn't do well in school, you are not going to be a good software engineer. So speaking of leak code, we spend so much time learning how to traverse binary trees, reverse link lists, and determining the time complexity of certain sorting algorithms. But when you actually get the job, it turns out you're spending your entire day doing crud and changing button colors. Companies will really put you through the ringer and make you solve these challenging problems on a whiteboard without an IDE, with a crazy time limit, and the interview process actually looks nothing like your day-to-day -day job. A lot of people have said this, and I completely agree, but interviewing skills is a completely different set of skills than coding on the job. On a brighter note, and this is my personal experience, but I've always found that working at a nine to five job is a lot less intellectually demanding than school. And that's for better or worse. There are obviously parts that are very difficult at work, such as dealing with the bureaucracy or personal conflict, or having to get up in the middle of the night to be on call. But overall, the coding part is a lot more mundane than what you do at school. The good news is that if you really struggled with leak code questions and other algorithmic challenges, chances are the coding problems that you're going to be solving at work are probably not going to be as intellectually and cognitively demanding as leak code was and of course this is highly individual on your role and your company the downside is that the work you do at your day-to-day -day job could be so mundane that in order to progress and get better as a software engineer or even just not get stale, you're gonna need to consciously take time out of your day to continue to do tutorials and learn or else you won't be very competitive the next time you need to interview. All right, guys, thank you so much for watching. That's all I have for you today and I will see you in the next one. Bye-bye.